Charles is a graduate of King's College School uh, in Cambridge, and he has a master's degree in uh, modern history and politics from the University of Oxford. Uh, he is the Englishman part of the Mad Dogs and Englishmen podcast. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times. Uh, he's been on the Bill Maher Show and uh, uh, MSNBC, several cable news shows. Uh, he is currently the editor of nationalreview.com. Uh, please welcome the right honorable <laughs> Charles C.W. <Hogan. laughs> So no, I'm actually not the right honorable. I'm not allowed to be because I became an American citizen last year and you have to renounce foreign titles. So even if I had been the right honorable, I wouldn't have been allowed to keep that. Um, thank you all for having me. I was driving here from Las Vegas yesterday and I was thinking that I couldn't really imagine a more different place and scenery um, than where I grew up in England, except maybe the surface of the moon. Um, but then I just had a tour and it was all Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare and a bunch of ghosts and hauntings. So now I feel really um, at home. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a big free market guy. Um, I'm not an entrepreneur myself. I'm a journalist, um, but I am the editor of National Review online and we are big champions of free markets. Um, but what I don't want to do today is, is stand here and just list all of the great blessings that free markets and private property have, have brought us over the last 300 years or so. Um, it is, of course, true that at no point in human history have we ever seen anything like the explosion in innovation and prosperity um, that we're now enjoying. Um, and it's true that free markets have proven to be the greatest destroyer of poverty that the world has ever seen. Just in the last 20 years, uh, the international poverty rate has been halved, which is an extraordinary achievement. It's three billion, three and a half um, billion people. But I think it's important uh, to note that even if that wasn't true, even if free markets were just one way of looking at the world among many, they would still be morally imperative uh, and they would still be crucial to the way of life we enjoy here in America. I, I first started thinking about this topic back in 2011 when I was covering the Occupy Wall Street protests in uh, New York City. I, I came over that year for an internship at National Review and um, within a couple of months of being here, the tents had started to go up in Zuccotti Park in downtown New York. Um, I was pretty curious, so I went down there uh, pretty much every day uh, of the two months that it lasted um, and I became basically National Review's Occupy Wall Street guy and most of my time there was spent either talking to older protesters who had been to pretty much every protest in the last 60 years. There was one woman I met, very nice lady, she showed me her protest drum and it had stickers all over it, and one of them was, was protesting against Lyndon Johnson. So she, she was seriously committed as a protester. <laughs> or to younger people who had never been to a protest before, but were idealistic, were new to politics. Um, some of them, I think, were a little naive. I mean, there was one guy I remember meeting who really seemed to believe there was about to be a revolution, and he would start his sentences like, you know, once the government falls, or um, after the rebellion, um, but, you know, he was a nice guy and he was, he was new to it all. And there, but there was one guy there um, who was there quite a lot and he intrigued me because he, he was wearing a cardboard box in the way, not in, a, in the way you might see um, someone who was homeless, but in the way a, 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 you know, a three-year-old would dress up as a robot. And he was shouting, it's up to us. It's up to us. And eventually I went up to him and I asked him, what he meant by this, and he pointed to his box, and on the front of the box, it said, it's up to us. And, um, which, you know, I'd, I'd, got, I'd got by then. But on the back, he had written a, a list of economic systems, just a whole list. Um, and he'd list, I wrote them down, he listed capitalism, socialism, mercantilism, autarky, distributism, fascism, communism, feudalism, 
mutualism, and, and so forth. And then under that, he'd written, it's our democracy, and we can choose the system that we want. And I spoke to this guy for a while. He was a pretty intelligent, interesting guy. And I realized what he believed was that the, the only thing that really mattered in American life was democracy, and that using that democracy, Americans were free to choose whatever system they wanted on top of it, essentially. Um, and I thought, that is just completely spectacularly wrong. Um, why? Well, because in America, we have a very different conception of democracy than many other countries. We don't see it in just procedural terms, and we never have. What I mean by that is we, of course, demand that our government is run by people that we elect, and, and it should be. And we demand that on certain issues, majority rule is imperative. But we don't accept that majorities can do whatever they want to us simply because they're in the majority. On the contrary, in America, we actually insist on the opposite, that we leave a lot of room for people, for civil society, for individuals. It's not undemocratic, for example, to insist that the people in this room get to choose their own breakfast. That is not something that we put up to a vote at the national level. Which means there's a paradox. There's a when we say democracy in America, we're just as likely to be talking about what we don't allow a vote on as to what we do. Freedom of religion is perceived in America as democracy. Protest marches are perceived as democracy. Freedom of speech is perceived as democracy. Civil rights are perceived as democracy. Jury trials are perceived as democracy. And by extension, attempts to undermine those things are seen as undemocratic. Americans, at least most of them, would be appalled by the idea of holding a vote to enable speech restrictions or warrantless searches or put people in prison without uh, a jury trial and saying, but the majority wanted it, would not be deemed acceptable. We would be appalled if the government began to arrange marriages or dictate the order of service at church or run the Little League in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. My argument today is that whether we think about this in those explicit terms or not, we actually have a similar instinct around free markets and around entrepreneurship. We see free markets in America as a natural facilitating mechanism for our day-to-day -day life, rather than as some system that was contrived in a laboratory and then chosen, rather than as one option on the list of my friend in the, in the robot box. Um, as I, I wrote recently in the magazine, Americans engage in democratic acts all the time without thinking about it or without actually voting. Electing to attend this speech is a democratic act, notwithstanding that I know you want the, the credit points. <laughs> Electing to start a company in your garage is a democratic act. Banding together to establish a union or a cooperative is a democratic act. Selecting the company from which you source your goods and services and choosing what to buy is a democratic act. Choosing to uh, trade with someone in another country is a democratic act. When majorities step into those arenas and they say no, what they're doing is keeping millions of your free choices off the ballot. Now, as a technical matter, the US Constitution is silent on economic questions, but it's not silent on the expectations for the individual and on the role of government. And the limited government that the US Constitution permits is incompatible with any other system than the one we have. And one of the weird superstitions I think we have and we have to watch for as a country is the idea that if someone pays for something or sells something or sets up a business, that he's primarily engaging in commerce, this other category, rather than in, say, personal or cultural or religious or sporting or self-expressive behavior. The fact that a transaction is commercial doesn't negate everything else about it. If a speech is made by the New York Times Company or by Volkswagen, it's still speech. And the fact that it's speech is still the most interesting thing about it. A paid defense lawyer who makes his living defending the accused is still engaging in justice. And lobbyists, I know we all like to hit on lobbyists, but lobbyists are still petitioning for redress of grievances. We don't permit the government to ban things 
under the argument that is not touching um, other areas. We don't allow the government to ban ink and say, well, it's not touching freedom of the press. We don't allow it to seize churches and then say, well, it's not touching freedom of religion. It's just commerce. We can't separate out the market we have from other democratic behavior in which we engage as a society. So yeah, entrepreneurs run businesses. That's one way of looking at it. But it's the least interesting thing that they do. What's interesting is what those businesses do whether that's cook food or design telephones or provide plastics or sell books or teach uh, kids the alphabet. And if we remove that market or we get in, in the way of that market, then we're closing off all those uh, avenues and activities. If, as my friend at Occupy Wall Street suggested, we're free to choose other systems, then we're free to choose systems without free markets and we're free to crush people's capacity to make their own way in life without having to assemble a majority and gain its approval. One of the things that irritates me about our current debates is that the opponents of free markets have managed to uh, garner a reputation for being edgy when they're no such thing. The opponents of free markets are the man. They're the king. They're the bureaucrat on the 14th floor of the concrete building telling you what to do. The rebels and the dissenters in American life are the entrepreneurs. At root, an entrepreneur is a person who says, you know what, I don't want to work for that guy. Or I don't like the way this is being done. Or the status quo is not good enough, I'm going to fix it. The entrepreneur is the one guy who refuses to clap at the dear leader's speech. He's the lay preacher on the upturned soapbox who articulates new heresies for all to hear. He's the misfit who looks at the wheel and says, what if? I've drawn a good number of analogies today with free speech, but I think they're appropriate. We defend free speech on the grounds that it is better to have a vast marketplace of ideas than a few approved lines, even if on occasion the results are unpleasant. And so it is with free markets. Just as fresh thinkers can only thrive absent the censor's pen, so entrepreneurs can only exist in rambunctious, messy cultures that tolerate differences and refuse to reify and ossify the views of the powerful. And the thing is, the results in America genuinely are incredible. Because we have such a strange toleration for individual autonomy here, America has invented all sorts of odd things that would never be dreamed up and haven't been dreamed up in a controlled economy in other places. I'm not just talking about the profusion of small businesses you see everywhere in the country many of which are named for their owners uh, or a family or if you're an immigrant like me for everything American we can think of. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, that Family Guy episode when um, Peter Griffin is looking for a dry cleaners and he's trying to work out which of the two is owned by an immigrant and the one on the left is called Spencer's Cleaners and the one on the right is called Super Cowboy USA Hot Dog Rocket Ship American Cleaners Number One. <laughs> We, we, we do that. Um, my, my local French restaurant in, uh, in Florida is called JJ's Liberty Bistro, and the guy who owns it is French, so this is a, this is a real habit. But. <laughs> but I'm talking about the weird things that Americans have invented, like roller coasters and hot pockets and <laughs> drive-in movie theaters and paintball and bubble gum and the electric guitar and virtual reality glasses, and Star Wars, and the golf cart. Now, there's no reason you guys should know this, especially living here, but um, all over the internet, there are hundreds of companies that specialize in custom parts for golf carts, and hundreds of videos that show you how to install them. Now, I know this because I bought a golf cart recently. <laughs> um, I've never played golf in my life. Um, and I swapped out the three horsepower engine in it for an 11 horsepower engine in it, much to the <laughs> delight of my three-year-old. And I added some extra seats and mirrors and a stereo uh, and some beer uh, uh, cup holders. Um, <laughs> but that's just not the case everywhere in the world. The options are extraordinary. And I'll give you a, a, a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. It's gone out of business now, but there used to be a company not too far from here in... Um, Clearfield, Utah, called uh, Aerodynamics. 
started in Mountain View, California, eventually moved here. And it started in a warehouse in 1946. It was run by four guys, all of them veterans of World War II, and their original idea was to be a repair shop for cars, trucks, and machine tools. But it didn't actually work out like that. Before long, these guys had begun to tinker in their warehouse, and they were so impressed with themselves that they contacted a guy called Walt Disney, who was at that point looking to build Disneyland in California. And um, they offered to help him build it. Now, none of these guys had college degrees, not a single one. And none of them had any formal training in engineering at all. In fact, that company didn't have a trained engineer working for it until the late 1970s. But over the next 30 years, they built not only half the rides at Disneyland, but they invented pretty much everything that you now think of if you think of an amusement park. They invented the steel roller coaster. They invented the mine train, the log flume, the dark ride, the bobsled. They built the first roller coaster to go upside down and the first roller coaster to hang from the track and the first roller coaster to rise above 200 feet. They built everything. It's a small world is their fault. <laughs> the second is, is a TV show that I used to watch in England as a kid called uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, this has always interested me because as hard as I try, I cannot imagine the look on the faces of the guys at the TV company when this show was pitched, right? <laughs> I mean, the writers went in and they were asked what their idea was. And then they must have begun to describe this sort of insane drug vision, right? <laughs> well, it's about these four turtles, which they're mutants, and uh, they live down a sewer, and they train in various martial arts under a rat called Splinter. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and what are their names? <laughs> well, uh, they're actually all named after um, Italian Renaissance painters. <laughs> Oh, they are, they are, yeah, yeah. Hence their love of pizza, obviously. I mean, that only happens in America. <laughs> because, because the only thing that mattered here was that kids all over the world went crazy for it, just as they had for Disneyland and for aerodynamics. In no universe would aerodynamics or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have existed without free markets? Nobody in his right mind would have commissioned those products from the center. Now, Arrow would have been asked, you want to spend $20 million sending a train through a corkscrew? <laughs> Why? So yeah, markets support business, but more important than that, they support entrepreneurs and ultimately civil society itself. And that, I hope, is what we're all ultimately aiming for. Thank you for listening to me talk. I'm happy to take questions on any subject whatsoever, as long as it's not Downton Abbey. <laughs> <laughs>but the first thing is, I think you've got to keep the country free for entrepreneurs. Um, that's not to say you have to vote a particular way. It's not to say you have to have a particular ideology or agree with me on everything. But the root cause of America's uh, prosperity, but also its weirdness, and the weirdness is important, is the ability to fail. And is the ability to try different things without having to ask for permission. And you know, the, the country I'm from is fairly free, but it doesn't have that culture. Leave aside government for a moment. It just doesn't have that culture in the same way. In fact, until recently, this is, a, this is a weird thing about England. Until about 10 years ago, if you had failed or gone bankrupt in business, you were barred for 10 years from sitting on another company's board because you were deemed to be a threat. But of course, in many cases, that's the wrong way around. If you've failed and gone bankrupt, then you probably have quite a lot of good advice um, for businesses. So culturally, um, the structure has to stay there. Um, but as I say, I, I don't like this focus that we have on commerce. I don't like the word capitalism either because it, it's, it's, it's really s was set up in opposition to Marxism. It's a, I like the word free market. Um, 
because what it is doing is it's explaining what most people who are not all, but what most people who own businesses are trying to do, which is to achieve something, not to make a bunch of money. Now, the money is really important. It's a mechanism. But the, I think if people start by saying, I'm going to make a lot of money and I will work out later what I'm going to do, then they're, then they're going to fail. Um, so as I said, I'm not an entrepreneur, but from my experience in this, one, you've got to keep the environment free. And secondly, the focus should always be on what it is you're trying to achieve, not on the structure with, of your business and, and, and not solely on the bottom line. What do you think the, uh, the impact was of the government bailout of the banks in 2008 and 2007 on free market? I think it was bad. I think it was bad for a number of reasons. And you know, w one of the reasons that I'm not mindlessly disparaging of Occupy Wall Street is they had a lot in common with the Tea Party. It was a general. Um, criticism of the status quo. Now, I disagree profoundly with most of the things Occupy Wall Street wanted, but I think the f feeling that there were two systems in place was really bad for um, America's faith in the market and, and faith in the country. So the first thing is I think there was a diminishment in faith in free markets, which, is a, which was a bad thing. Um, the, the response, in my view, had a component of it that was probably necessary and a component of it that has made the problem arguably worse. Um, I really, as a free marketeer, would have liked to say just let everyone who went out of business go out of business, but given the way that the country is set up and regulated and given how close big business is to government, which is not free markets. Free markets um, are, are, are not everything to do with business. There's, there's, a, there's a distinction there. Um, I think that that might have caused so much suffering for people, especially people who didn't have a great deal to begin with, that it would have been un unpalatable um, and probably morally indefensible. That there is a part of me, though, that would have loved to have seen you know, big banks that are in bed with the government just go under and say, well, you believe in capitalism, you know, enjoy it. Um, but it, again, it wouldn't have probably been those people who suffered. It would have been the poorest among us. Um, but I think some of the reactions have actually just made things worse. I mean, we now have more consolidation. We have more big banks than we had before. Small businesses are struggling to keep. It's always small businesses that struggle with regulation because they can't buy off politicians. Um, so you know, overall, it was pretty bad in, in, in toto. Um, the, the challenge now is to remind people that while it has flaws and needs regulation, uh, that this is the greatest engine of prosperity and creativity that the world has ever seen. I mean, if you look, if you look at history, historical um, GDP production for the whole world, y you get from the beginning of any measurements whatsoever to about 1750, and it's completely flat. And then it just goes up, just explodes. Um, and that was, that's not just now a, a, a boon to people in the West. That's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing what's happened to India in the last 20 years. You know, people who had absolutely nothing are now moving up. <coughs> They're not starving on the streets. They have medical care. Um, so I think it's worth, you know, we've got to keep that in mind. But I think 2008 was not a great advertisement for the market. On regulation, government has a role to play. The, the, the argument for government from a libertarian perspective is that it sh is there to protect rights and enforce contracts. Um, now, you don't allow every contract, of course, because there are some contracts that are inherently exploitative and that aren't really contracts at all. Slavery, um, some would argue prostitution. Um, but yeah, you're going to have a government role. And government has some role in regulating the economy, um, there are risks associated with it because big corporations tend to capture those government organizations and then they get the regulations that they want that in the name of protecting consumers actually just pushes out their competition. So that's always something to work for. But I mean, I, d I don't know anyone 
um, even within my magazine's orbit that is anti-regulation per se. Um, so the second part of your question was, remind me? Uh, oh, the, the in inequality. Um, well, I have two views on this. The first is that the, the most recent data from the Census Bureau shows that inequality in America has stayed relatively flat for the last 30 years, despite the rhetoric. Um, now, what we do have is people moving out of the middle class, but they're often moving up. And we do have a new group of incredibly wealthy people that we didn't have before. That is mostly the product of free trade and globalization. The markets for products are, are so vast now especially with China opening up, that you're just going to have more people who are worth $100 billion. That doesn't bother me in the slightest. I'm concerned exclusively with how people are living on the bottom end. I, it, 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 it's a problem of success. To look at somebody who's worth $100 billion, fine, good luck to you. The question is, do people at the bottom have food, housing, do they have medical care? Those are the debates I think we should be having. Um, not least because I don't think that you can help that issue by tearing down the people who have a lot of money. Um, so it, it, what, you know, often you, you will find people saying the problem is how big the gap is between here and here. I don't think that's true at all, providing that we're moving up relatively together. Um, if we're not, or if the bottom segment is, is getting poorer and um, finding it harder to, to live, then that is a problem. But the fact we have a Jeff Bezos and a Bill Gates, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing, I think. So there are industries, especially the tech industries, that are now looking to find ways to protect themselves, similar to the ways that miners and factory workers in the 20s and 30s are because of similar exploitative practices without the physical danger. What do you feel could have been done to avoid that? Do you think that there was just irresponsibility among management, or do you think that there could have been a way to avoid tech companies looking for unionization? Can, can you give me an example of... of the, video, the video game industry looking to unionize and avoid having constant crunch. Okay. Um, so I'm by no means an expert in the, in the video game industry. Um, W w why is it unionizing? What's the argument here? Sorry, I'm... Basically that it's overtime for 20-hour work weeks for on without end and no overtime pay. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't see the tech companies as being different than any other companies except in that they've in general created a bunch of challenges that we're not quite sure how to uh, address. Um, the, the probably the existing regulation of labor markets will suffice. I mean, if we're talking about something like Uber, that might be a little bit outside of the norm because what you have there is people who are in some senses employees, but in some senses not employees, and it's very difficult to work out actually how to regulate them under the law. Um, if you have somebody who's actually working in a building and he has a contract that says he's going to be paid for this number of hours, um, then the existing unionization rules and overtime rules are probably sufficient. My bigger worry in the tech space is that we are, we are now being asked some questions that are very difficult to answer given our current models. I mean, one of them, for example, is this. Um, what is an algorithm in the eyes of the government? So if, if you, we have this distinction in the law between publishers and platforms. A publisher is, for example, the organization that runs the magazine that I edit. We look at every piece, we fact check every piece, and we print it. And if in that piece there is a libelous statement about somebody, they can sue us for choosing to disseminate that. That's a long-standing principle in law. In the tech industry, that doesn't make sense because the vast majority of the tech platforms that we all use, they don't do that. You can write what you like on Facebook, they don't check it. They might check it after the fact, but they never saw it beforehand, they didn't fact check it, they had no bearing whatsoever in its publication. But then there's this middle ground where you can write an automated script and essentially tell it what to do. So you could say, highlight any news that has to do with the 
sexual abuse allegations against President Trump. Now, have you published that in the way that National Review does? You certainly didn't look at it, you didn't fact check it. But you are also redistributing it around the world deliberately and having decided that those are the variables you're going to use. I don't know how you even begin to regulate this. I think this is probably um, the next challenge. In terms of bad working conditions, I think we probably have the tools to deal with that. We just, we now have different ways of working that they'll need to be applied to. So what do you see to be the present dangers for the free market? Mm. A lot of them are the old dangers for the market, which is um, big companies capturing government power and using it to protect themselves and destroy their competition. Um, I also think that every 30 years or so we need to win the old arguments as to why free markets are a good thing. I mean, my, my parents were in their 20s in England in the 1970s and the country was a complete train wreck. I mean, they had rolling blackouts, endless strikes, there were, it took you, the telephone company was nationalized. It took you three months to get a telephone. So what people used to do is lie and say they were a doctor. So at one point in about 1976, you had a million doctors <laughs> on the waiting list um, for telephones. This model didn't work and it was, it was dismantled and it was replaced and we have saw remarkable prosperity as a result. Um, and yet the leader of the Labour Party in England, who has a chance of becoming the next Prime Minister, agrees with all those old policies. That's his political platform, which is you know, astonishing, certainly to my, my dad. Um, so I think, I think the biggest challenge is probably re-winning the old arguments. And, and as I said earlier, one of the problems with that is that, that 2008 really hurt because <coughs> people who couldn't pay their mortgage <coughs> lost their house. But many people who worked in the banks, who make multi-million dollar salaries, walked away scot-free. And that strikes people as being unfair. Now, as I say, in the, in the end, I think we probably had to do a lot of it, um, because otherwise the knock-on effects would have been even worse for the people at the bottom. But that is a, it, the, the reaction against that is understandable. This might sound kind of like offensive or something. Okay. <laughs> did, you mean, did you mean tolerable or understandable? I mean, yeah, to, I mean understandable. I mean, I, I, I understand why that sentiment crept up. Um, yeah. I guess my question is, is, like, so in a free market, then the employer does have the right to decide what type of working conditions exist for... Uh, well, blue collar, white collar, whoever, you know what I mean? So to what extent, to what extent, like, should we allow uh, the employers to decide the working conditions? Well, this goes back to the regulation question, right? That my, my main interest in a free market is that it allows people to fail and to experiment. And I don't think that you can replace that with any system <coughs> that is going to lead to the same level of prosperity or of creativity that we see. But that's not an argument for unregulated capitalism. It's not an argument for no rules on working conditions. Um, it is an argument for smart regulation, for local regulation, um, for understanding that in an awful lot of cases, the people who are doing a particular type of work know more about it than people who live 3,000 miles away. Um, but, I mean, there's, there's, again, I don't, I don't know anyone who is a free market advocate who wants to see child labor, who wants to see um, the sort of working conditions you're alluding to. Um, you know, th there is a reason that the United States outsources a lot of its manufacturing to China and Bangladesh, and that's that they don't have the same rules. Now, there are moral questions around that, but it is also a, an advantage that we don't have the same rules, right? <laughs> because if we did have the same working conditions, we wouldn't be outsourcing that work. Um, so that, that is a good thing. Um, I, I, I don't want you to confuse what I was arguing for for unregulated capitalism. That's not the case. Speaking of chi China, so obviously it's been a big uh, 
big sub subjects lately with Trump's trade war and such. And while I don't disagree with his methods, and especially since it threatens to derail the economy, but to me, it's pretty hard to dispute that there's a serious problem with how they act in the world economy with like rampant IP stealing and, and other their accusations of currency manipulation and having very poor standards by, by our comparison. So how, I'm just wondering, how do you think we should do is the best way to deal with it? I'm glad you asked that because that, that is, this is a topic that I am obsessed with. Um, it's slightly off this, this topic though. Um, I think the biggest challenge we have in government at the moment is not who the president is, it's not who's on the Supreme Court, it's not how angry we all are with each other. I think the biggest problem we have in our politics is that we are not abiding by the constitutional order as it was written. And that means that we are, in most cases, Democrat or Republican, bypassing Congress. We don't have a plan for China. We have presidents who win and lose and come in and are termed out, who do what they can on their own and are then replaced. I have my own views on trade and China, but President Trump has not put together a plan, put it to Congress, seen it passed, and then have it executed. That's not what's happened. What's happened is, for various reasons over the last 60 or 70 years, Congress has delegated powers to the president, not a president, to the president, whoever that might be, on national emergency grounds, on foreign policy grounds, and they have uh, refused steadfastly to take them back. There is arguably a legal justification for presidents setting tariffs on their own, but if you look back to the founding documents, the idea of a president without Congress imposing a tax, which is what a tariff essentially is, on his own, would have been sufficient to cause a revolution. And now we just accept this. Again, this isn't a Republican-Democrat thing. We accept it from both parties. We do the same, as an aside, when it comes to war. What we need in the United States is a plan to deal with IP infringement, to deal, if it is the case, that China is dumping, um, to deal with um, what look like aggressive international economic moves. And then it needs to be followed through. And if it's not working, it needs to be debated again and it needs to be changed. I honestly, I'm not being facetious here. I honestly get the impression <laughs> that the president makes this up on Twitter. I mean, that he says it's 20%. No, okay, well it's now you've annoyed me, it's 25%. That, that's not a plan, that is not a plan, that is caprice. Um, so I think there is some merit to the argument but what, what, we, what we are seeing is, the, is trade policy being used for very, very short-term gain by presidents who want to win re-election rather than by a Congress that together should be setting into law our parameters. I mean, it's not even a secret. During the early 2000s, President Bush uh, protected the steel industry because he needed to win Ohio in 2004. President Reagan did the same thing in the 80s with Harley Davidson and President Trump is doing it now. He wants to win the Midwest. He promised he would deliver on this and he's currently negotiating with China. If I were in his position I would arguably do the same thing but he shouldn't be in that position. So I think we need to go right back to the drawing board with this and have a discussion as a country. What do we want to do about the threat? How do we see China? Do we, do we think that it's acceptable for it to be screwing with us? Are the benefits of free trade worth it anyway? Do we have a, um, a joined up plan to deal with it? But we don't, we haven't done it. And I, I, I know this sounds uh, depressing, but I, I see no incentives <laughs> to get there. Um, I don't know if that answered your question or I just went off on a rant that I really wanted to <laughs> give. <laughs> Seem to have some very 
liberal libertarian views and uh, legalizing marijuana and gay marriage, things like that, that are opposed to the traditionally conservative views. And, and the second part is just you put libertarians in the right, um, where they could be seen as sure. traveling you know, both left and right. Um, what are your views on, on conservatism? I put libertarian on the right at that point because the president was a Democrat. When the president's a Democrat, libertarians moved into coalitions with conservatives. When the president's a Republican, they tend to move over to the other side. And the book was about um, how, given the status quo, the two sides can uh, work out their differences. Um, the, I mean, the word conservatarian is not one I came up with. Thankfully, it's a kind of ugly word. Uh, it's better than liberservative, which was the alternative. Um, <laughs> But it's one that I kept hearing from people who would say to me, you know, I'm a, I'm a, when I'm around conservatives, I feel libertarian. When I'm around libertarians, I feel conservative. Th there is no way to bridge the gap on, on a number of national issues. For example, immigration, foreign policy, I think they're always going to be at loggerheads. But the book really does two things. One, it argues that what we need at the moment, and I think this is truer than ever, is a return to a robust federalism, which will allow people who have profoundly different views to live in harmony together. Um, I do not, of course, think that in uh, every single case, there are national questions that you can't wave away like that. I don't think civil rights should be up to the states, and I don't think that the Bill of Rights is up to the states either. But on most issues, education, uh, energy, transportation, healthcare, the states have far too little power. And what it's doing is it's turning us against each other because we're so obsessed with who the next president is that when the person who we don't like wins, we think, well, we're screwed now for the next four years. They're going to come after us. Our whole way of life is up um, for grabs. And that was not how the country was supposed to, to work. Um, right from the beginning, the idea was to allow a lot of variation. Um, the substantive answer is that fusionism on the right has long been a successful and winning formula. It started with Frank Meyer in the 1950s with National Review. Um, conservatives and libertarians do have one thing in common as against progressives, and that is that they believe generally that human nature is fixed. And if you believe human nature is fixed, you don't think you can create a perfect society, and you're probably more likely to be humble in what you think you can achieve. And I think that leads to a, a, a good deal of um, alliance um, that that proves a lot harder when the left and libertarians get together because they tend to agree for example on a, a non-interventionist foreign policy although not always um, and they might agree on say the drug war um, but after that how these policies are implemented and what they mean in practice becomes really difficult to tease out so um, it, 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 if you read the book, you'll see it's in no way an attempt to answer every question. It's more of a framework as to how the two groups can work together and also how a country that is really quite profoundly divided um, can respect it, each other's decisions a little more by creating space. Um, what's, what's the word you would use in business? By limiting their exposure um, to each election. Probably have time for one more. <coughs> How do you think uh, Bill Buckley would review your book? What, do you, what comments do you think he would make? What are some comparisons, and some kind of contrast that you think he might highlight? What wow. Might <laughs> <laughs> Not to hold you to it. No, I mean, I'm, I'm enormously George pleased. George Will and yeah, I'm enormously pleased I never had to debate Bill Buckley on my book. Um, <laughs> What do I think he would have thought of it? Well, I think he'd have recognized a great deal of it because, as I say, that the heart of it is, uh, is in line with Frank Meyer's project, which was a project that was under uh, gone at National Review, not by National Review, because, of course, National Review has always had people who profoundly disagree with, with each other. But that would have been... Its basic thesis was, was very much within the line of... Uh, or the bounds of National Review's thinking. I think he would have been broadly in agreement with me on drugs, because he was. Um, 
I mean, I, you know, it was said earlier, I'm in favor of the legalization of marijuana. I'm actually in favor of the legalization of all drugs. Not because I think they're good, they're not. They're, they do bad things to you. Um, but because I think that our attempt to fight them has been a disaster. Um, and I think on balance, the, the harms that that has caused have outweighed the, the benefits. So I think he'd have recognized that. Uh, I'm sure he would not have agreed with me that gay marriage is a fine idea. Um, that would be because of his Catholic. Background. Well, that, and, and he was more socially conservative than I am, I think, instinctively. Um, I think probably I am less of a foreign policy hawk than he would have been, although he changed his mind on Iraq, certainly, towards the end of his life. Um, it's a fascinating question. It's difficult to know. <laughs> if I might just, um, do you attribute some of the, or all of the political dysfunction that we see around us to sort of a loss of trust in our institutions? And if so, do you see a time or circumstances under which we restore that trust? Um, I think the lack of trust in our institutions is arguably the product of, of the anger. And I think that the anger is in part the result of two things happening at the same time. One is that America has become more diverse. I don't mean that um, racially, I mean ge geographically, religiously, ideologically than it has been for a hundred years. And we have a political culture and a media culture that nationalizes every question. And the combination of those two things infuriates people. Um, Charles Murray had a really interesting essay and commentary when he said that the last point at which the United States was this uh, different, uh, was, this, was this diffuse, was about 1914. And that when you get to the middle of the 20th century, you see quite, quite a solidification, with the one exception, of course, of the South, which persisted in systematically oppressing African Americans. But other than the South, you have um, a fairly homogenous country. You have three television stations. Everyone watches Walter Cronkite in the evening. People read the same newspapers. Um, now we don't have that at all. I mean, we have atomization. The internet has come along. We read the news we want to. The cable has any option you want. Um, at the exact same moment, that we have decided we should elevate every question to national prominence. And so, you know, I see this on Twitter and I find it extraordinary. Indiana will pass a religious freedom law of the same sort that Connecticut has. And then people in Brooklyn will say, I'm never going to Indiana. And they will get upset about it for five days. I mean, they were never going there in the first place. <laughs> they wouldn't be seen dead in Indiana. And yet their whole life for a few days is built around this thing that has happened in a state they don't live in for reasons they probably haven't looked into. Um, that's a recipe for real um, pain. I'll just finish with this. I don't know how many people saw the video of those students at Yale after Donald Trump won the election running into the quad and just screaming for about half an hour. Now, it was really funny at one level because these people are adults and they should not behave like that. And I totally agree with the people who said, this is a bad sign that if this is how they deal with a setback. At the same time, it's not that funny if that's how they actually feel, right? I mean, if, if a primal scream was their reaction to an election, then we do have a problem. Um, and I think, and, and I don't think that problem is limited to, to Donald Trump per se. Um, and I, I think that the more we can diffuse that and, and lower people's exposure to what is happening in other places uh, and bring them more into line with their own community and their own town and their own state where they can find meaning without having to worry all the time about the shenanigans 3,000 miles away in a city on the East Coast, I think that is, that is a good thing. All right, well, thank you very much for listening to me. I appreciate it. Charles, we'd like to present you with uh, 
with the Cedar Award in recognition of your taking some time and spending time with us today. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank you.